Rey. Hello, hello. Welcome to this week's Lunch and Learn session. And it is a hot summer day, isn't it? This is why I've brought some flowers for you, for the amazing work you have been doing during this summer, and for the wonderful community we have become. And speaking about community, today we have invited somebody very special. Her name is Darian Kundiker, and some of you know her already because she has been working with you and helping you in your progress sessions. So Darian will be sharing with us how to build communities. Welcome Darian, how are you? Newbie uh, mistake, hi Viliana, <laughs> I'm really hi. good. Uh, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. We are looking very much forward to your presentation. So please take it away and share with us as many secrets as you can. I will. Um, so, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me and having introduced this amazing, interesting topic of community building. And second of all, I have to apologize in advance because my slides are incredibly word heavy. So I hope you can still take some of it, take notes, but you don't have to because most of the stuff which is on my slides, you can find in my resources in the end. So that uh, you know. And um, well, I offered to do uh, the lunch and learn today on community building because I have an extensive experience in community building. I have, um, founded or co-founded Poetry Slam, which is the spoken word literature movement in Mexico with uh, several hundred members today. Um, I uh, did campaigning, political campaigning in England on uh, poverty. I've worked with vulnerable youth. And uh, here in Switzerland, I was the community manager for uh, two think tanks actually, one on foreign policy and one on uh, science. And uh, on the side, as a hobby, four years ago, I founded a women's book club, which sounds kind of tame, but today we have over 70 members, very active members that meet very regularly to discuss books. Um, and I will share with you my knowledge from these experiences, from this community building experiences, which I think now I have 13 years of experience in doing that. I mean, most of it is on a hobby side, but some of it is also professional. And I'm sharing both with you, like from an academic perspective, from a personal perspective and a professional perspective. And I invite you as well to ask questions anytime. Just jump in, ask your questions right on the spot. So while we're on the topic, we can just answer it right there and then. So that is to me. Um, oh, and I work in the Impact Hub as well right now. But I don't do community work there, I do events, uh, which is kind of community, but uh, my focus is not community at the moment. So um, what we're gonna look at today are the foundations of a community. Um, maybe a lot of people think like, oh, a community doesn't, you don't have to look at it closely or so, but it's really important that you think about what is your shared identity. Then we talk about building a community. So how do you, how, what is the user journey like? What is the membership journey like? And also at the end, the community maintenance. So the structure more into governance, financing, and so on. Um, and you have to know most of the stuff I'm going to tell you comes from the community canvas. So you will definitely see most of the stuff I'm, I'm talking here about in that uh, canvas and in the, in the guidelines. So what is a community? You can talk, um, you can define a community into different uh, sections, but when you're building a community, it's incredibly important to ask yourself, 
a lot of questions because ideally in a community, everything, its members and activities, its processes and its values point back to and work towards the same thing, the organization's purpose. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So you see collective intention, that is your purpose. You have a shared identity, which is a huge part of a community. You have working, working practice, which can be guidelines, values, rules, um, structures in the community. You have a safe place. We will not talk about that that much because it's more of um, uh, uh, an institutional kind of thing. Celebration, which is super important and distributed roles. So what are the roles within a community? Um, and let's jump right into it. So um, purpose. When we're talking about a purpose of a community, you can have an internal or an external uh, purpose. Uh, the internal purpose is only concerned with the community itself, like helping each other or exchanging knowledge. This can be like when you're in a building and you have a group of neighbors, and they live together and they have maybe a WhatsApp chat and that's a very close internal community with the sole purpose of serving the neighbors. And an external purpose wants to have a collective effect on the world outside of the community. For instance, by advancing a cause, a product or a lifestyle or even a movement. Usually internal purposes are not explicitly defined. Here, it's helpful to be more precise. Think about your objectives when you have an internal purpose, like what is the goal of that community? And that helps align the members and their expectations. For instance, when uh, I did, uh, when in the book club, for instance, we have a very specific purpose that is to foster sisterhood and critical thought. And that purpose is kind of internal because we are a closed group, we only allow women, but anyone who is a woman or defines as a woman can come. So we have this internal uh, purpose to foster something, and that is something that attracts people or the members. Um, and an ex one an external purpose is important when you have, for instance, making the world a better place. Uh, an external purpose like that is important, but it also means that you need to create value for the members internally. So you can have internal external purpose, but you can have usually both. It's very rare that you only have an external purpose without having an internal purpose because through the internal purpose, usually members gain added value by creating relationships with their peers, with like-minded people, creating a network and relationships. So um, an important question you have to ask yourself when thinking about the purpose is also, who can influence the purpose? Um, because sometimes you have communities built within larger corporations and maybe the larger corporation or the company has maybe a kind of different goal or a set of values in the community. So you have to check that those two align because if they are misaligned, you might have um, potential conflicts. So in the purpose, we have internal, external. Your purpose is your raison d'être. That means like this is what attracts everyone to come to you, work with you, collaborate with you, share knowledge, share time, share experience and so on. And your purpose when you are um, uh, identifying or, or communicating your purpose, it needs to have some sort of urgency or it's usually better if it has some sort of, some sort of sense of urgency since it attracts people to really act and do something and commit their time. And this purpose also needs to be meaningful because a meaningful purpose means you will, be get, you will get from your members real commitment. If your purpose is just wishy-washy, not clearly defined, it doesn't have a, a real meaning to it, it's just, it's kind of superficial, you will probably not gain real commitment from the people because the purpose also aligns with the goals and if you don't have a proper purpose, you don't have proper goals. And it must be clear from the purpose as well that you that the members gain added value from collaborating and that must be communicated transparently. So just give me a second, I'm gonna close my door. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, when we're talking about a shared identity, we also have to think about who is the community for? Communities are for someone, always think that it's for someone. It's not for you, it's for someone. You are creating a space for other people to exchange, to participate, to be active. 
And um, communities share usually a commonality or a set of commonalities. And commonalities can be geographical, like we all live in Kreis 3, in Kreis 3. Or it can be ideological, like we all have um, a, a political view of something. So you have political parties, for instance, which are ideological. It can be experiential, like uh, a group of people share a certain set of experiences and that makes them kind of get together and share these experiences. It can be a self-help group, it can be um, mama, mother, young mothers groups and so on, because you, you will get with people who share a, a, a similar experience as you. A commonality can also be social, like you just wanna hang out together, you like each other, and um, it is merely to, to get to know people and expand your network. Affinity, uh, commonality is affinity means that you have a, a, a shared hobby or a shared, um, you're, you're all fans of a certain music group or of a football club. So you share this affinity together and you define yourself through being fans of F to Z, for instance. And it can be personal as well. It can be about uh, 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 your personal experience as a human being that you can share with other people. Um, in smaller communities, the shared identities are easy to identify, but the larger community grows, it's important to be explicit about what defines the identity of the member. In order for a community to come together, it's important that the commonality or the set of commonalities is part of every member's identity. So really make sure that everyone who is in your community shares whatever your purpose is as part of their identity as well. And they need to define themselves at least partially through this commonality. Um, a community perceives itself as a distinct in some respect to the larger society within it, it, it exists. So you have society and then you have the commonalities and there you form certain communities, right? And it might even have, sometimes you might have a, a, a combined enemy or a force you fight for, or uh, you need to protect yourself from something which are, harsher ways of, 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 of defining a community, but these are also definitely valid points. Um, and sometimes communities create a somehow us versus them environment. And uh, to define, they do that to define their own distinctiveness, their, and their communities develop and foster common languages or um, secret languages or rituals or symbols or, or stories. And um, here I wanted to show you just, um, two videos on the difference between like these very distinct communities, which can also be called clubs. And a club <clears throat> is usually defined by closing itself more from the otherness or from the other. So we create more of an us versus them mentality and what a, and how a community is built around a purpose. So here's a short um, video. And it shows you how a community is built around a purpose. So you have people popping up around there and they really share and in different spheres and different um, uh, parameters, peripheries of the purpose, so a bit further away, a bit closer to it, but you get a lot of people who share this common set of purpose or, or identity to a certain extent. And then you have what a club would be and a club has also at the beginning a purpose, a goal, which people share. And then you find, oh, so there's the video. <clears throat> um, you have the people coming together, forming uh, a, a community around uh, a purpose, but then suddenly they close off the walls. Like, so if you are a bit further away from that purpose, you are not invited into this community anymore, but the more you close it off and the more people are around this purpose, usually very often the purpose itself shrinks. So an, an example for that is for instance, you know, like um, fraternities, for instance, that at some point were to uh, further education and networking and, and, and strengthen academic success and so on. I mean, it's more like a, an American thing. Nowadays, they're more like party and, and, and we all have heard horror stories about fraternities in the States. Um, so they kind of lost their initial purpose of what the community or the club should have been. So when you're creating your community, think about how closed your walls are, how distinct is the non-membership journey 
or the membership journey. What is an active, what is an inactive member? Think about that and think also that you always, when you're, when you're creating a community, when you're creating a community, when you're um, communicating with your people, always make sure to have the purpose in the center of everything all the time. That is super important. So enough of the club. Um, so again, I said at the beginning, we have to ask a ton of questions when we're building a community. And it's the best when you're building, you're at the early stages of your organizations, of your projects. So this is a perfect moment in time. You have probably already defined uh, your, your mission, your goals and so on, on the organization, what they mean. And if you wanna create a community within that organization, this is a perfect moment to really ask yourself a lot of questions on who is the community for again. So here we have questions like, what are the traits that members share? So this is again identity. What does the community describe? How does the community describe its members? Uh, who are the community's most active members? How do you describe them? And this is really important. And how does the community take special care of them? So these questions are really important because they take you, the, they, they're not just like at the beginning, they will be with you the entire community journey throughout. And also really important at the end, you see two questions around diversity. Um, so most communities are selective about who can join, right? Only those with the same passion and purpose and the same qualities, the same values, they come together and form a community. And as a result, usually community members feel really proud. And this is something you really have to feed on and, and benefit from because this pride, this, this, this sense of privilege and honor to be a member is really important in your community. Um, what members always like most about the community are simply and very usual and pretty much all the time, the people. So the people are your most important, I'm gonna say product, but I don't mean product, is your, your centerpiece of the whole thing, the people, and do get in good people. So an usual membership cycle goes from uh, recruits to novices to regulars or super users, leaders, and finally elders or alumni. And we'll talk about these different um, roles throughout the, the presentation. So to the, the, the third and the fourth question, talk around uh, the super users or the regulars or the most active users. And they are your community's most valuable members. They're usually early adopters super active and the biggest fans to the outside world. So they're usually like um, profits to your community. They talk about it to everyone. Probably they're very passionate, very enthusiastic people. If you're already building a community or if you're part of a community, you know who we're talking about. Those are the people who are constantly communicating. They bring in people and they're super important. They have a lot of energy, enthusiasm, and that inspires your other members who are maybe a bit shyer, maybe a bit more introvert, maybe don't know yet if they really want to join. They're with one foot in or out. Um, and, and their engagement is crucial to your community's success. And their disengagement can be dangerous to your group. If you lose super users, if you lose these super active members, uh, that can actually destabilize groups. It can uh, create unhealthy environments. It can make people feel insecure. So in order to not lose your super members or to give them a, a pleasurable journey throughout, you have to also ask yourself how to take special care of them. And um, so you take special care of them by giving them, for instance, specific roles or giving them specific um, uh, responsibilities or involving them more in the community or you communicate with them more closely. So they get some sort of um, gratitude or, or, you know, some a certain set of a certain type of spotlight on them and appreciation that really really helps and you can you can identify for yourself for your member journey what is adequate what is in your capacity what is in your financial capacity what is in your time capacity how you can appreciate your most active members the best um, but most communities do talk with when you have volunteer community for instance uh, my experience has been so far with the most actives I would talk two, three times a week. And, and so they know they're seen, they're there, they're important, like they're, they're, um, their effort and work and time is not just like not seen because usually community members work for free or they do everything for free. So you do have to appreciate them. And the last two questions are on diversity. 
And diversity is an incredibly important issue and it is not addressed enough in most communities I have worked in so far. So really take this to heart. A mature, uh, 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 an organic, uh, a smart, intelligent, and probably sustainable community must be diverse. And the problem with diversity is that it often doesn't come naturally and it doesn't come easily. So you have to put in the extra effort to make your community as diverse as possible. Because if it's not diverse, you will be, for instance, let's assume you're um, uh, uh, a society that, have, I don't know, mm, I don't know, like in, in the think tank where I worked, we were on foreign policies and obviously our target group was, one, was young people, but we did once a diversity workshop and we realized there very quickly that everyone was privileged. Like we had maybe two, three people who were like from an immigration family or um, didn't grow up as wealthy as the others, but everyone had tutors and music classes and, you know, all these things that make you very privileged. And then we realized, oh damn, we, Need to make sure that we make it more diverse but how do you do that so really when you're thinking about your journey experience uh, your member experience your member journey think about how you can make it more diverse that can be ethnic backgrounds that can be religious backgrounds that can be religious uh, political backgrounds it can be age gender sexual orientation you think of it try to get as many people as possible engaged and make the process um or or or, or make the communication and the events and, and the shared experience as comfortable and welcoming for everyone in the community. So um, rituals and event formats must speak to the diverse community and to all types of members. That is really important. Whew, um, <laughs> I'm gonna have a sip of water. Well, it's actually lemonade, but who cares? Um, so who is the community for part three? really important in your community, in your shared identity are the values. And vi values, and this is very like, they are integrated in the purpose of course, but really think about your values as well. Values ought not to be just nice. Make them tangible, make them, uh, you know, passionate, but just don't make them nice. It's, it's nice, we're over nice, we're 2020, nice is not working. We need to be radical. If you're radical, we need to be um, direct and open and welcoming and kind. And very important, never, never um, uh, mistake kindness with niceness. So niceness and kindness, I hope you're all aware that there's a huge difference. Being nice is polite, is pretty, pretty superficial and kindness is way deeper, it's empathetic it's compassionate. So really like when you're thinking about your values, make them compassionate, make them kind, but not nice. Um, and make them tangible. So tangible means maybe, inter so you have your purpose, which can be one sentence, but your values can be a bit more extensive. So think about your values in maybe a manifesto way. So you can, uh, for instance, the Impact Hub in, in Switzerland has a co-manifesto, which was created by, um, by, by, by the whole community and they share uh, this radical collaboration mindset and so on. So a manifesto is a really good way of making people feel passionate about your values. And then also, so when you're on this whole journey of values and purpose and identity and so on, how do you define success? So maybe you've heard of measuring um, measuring and, 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 and measuring impact. Um, it's easier when you have external purposes, like you are a political group, for instance, and you want to change a certain set of initiative, like a vote. So that's a very clear goal. You want to you wanna bring an initiative forward to the public and you want the public to vote on this. And if they voted on this, clear success. Or if they only voted marginally on this, maybe you have to set like uh, different success levels, obviously. So that's kind of easier. But if you're an internal uh, purpose community, then it's a bit harder to define what success is. So you have soft success criteria and they can be about seeing activity, seeing how, um, how much people interact with each other, how many people turn up, uh, how many people invite maybe others and so on, or, or how regular you meet and how regular everyone is there. Um, you can also define success by measuring trust and measuring activity and also a lot of people don't like them. I'm personally a fan of KPIs because they help me keeping track 
of what I'm doing in a community or um, how everybody else is feeling. So you can definitely define KPIs and the, the KPIs can be, we want to do um, a certain a certain number of experiments a month, or we want to integrate that many people into our online community, or we want to get so many people um, to engage with with a um, with a forum. Like it can be different sets of KPIs, obviously. And um, oh, so important. What is important also, but I have to go back a bit. But by the values, is how do you want your members to treat each other? And um, how do your values help fulfill your community's ultimate purpose? Um, you can also think about your val values in what is our community's vibe? Are we more professional? Do we wanna, um, do we, do we wanna further professional growth or do we wanna further more emotional growth or do we wanna further more critical uh, questioning and thinking? So really like think about the vibe you are manifesting in your community. And in these values, like you have to think about how to capture and communicate them both internally and externally continuously so that people who jump in at a random times of the day still get a grasp of what you are about. Um, so both the values and the success definition, the shared identity, there are your North star, your guiding light for everything that are your actions and your, or, and your intentions in the community. And very important when thinking about the values, make sure they are not mandated from top to bottom. Um, but there is a difficulty to it because when you think like, oh, then we just do it bottom up. But usually communities don't work like that because people are like, oh no, this person is responsible. Oh no, this person is responsible. So when you're creating a community, you have to find a dialogue with your members and create um, and, and, and find a balance between modeling from top down and co-developing the set of values together. Because if you have a set of values that are created together, like a manifesto, people will feel more attracted, more committed, more passionate about the cause. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions so far? I don't know, I don't know if I, <laughs> just rambling through. <laughs> You're doing great, no rumbling. Uh, please <laughs> unmute yourself if you have any questions. I just thought I may, get, I may take a short break, but uh, if no one has any questions, we just go through with I, it. I have one if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you briefly uh, talk about the difference between a purpose and the goals of an organization? So a purpose, is, yes. you, yeah. Purpose and the goals of an organization. So the purpose is, you know, a, usually a one sentence or a couple of words, just defining the direction we're going in. So it's something where people can latch on quite quickly. And um, I can I can I can give you an example. For instance, um, when I founded the Poetry Slam in Mexico, um, the purpose was a. You can also say a motto, for instance, for the purpose. But the purpose, uh, the motto was "Tienes algo que decir." You have something to say. And, and people came, people walked two hours in this singeing sun because they couldn't afford the bus ticket to get to the workshops because they were like, I have something to say. And that is very powerful. Like, I don't want to give myself the credit, oh my God, that's so powerful, but it, it's powerful to have a purpose that really like gets people like, oh, like I want to do this. Like, I, and if you, that's what I mean. Like, don't be, don't be, um, you have to find a very nice balance between being vague and being very open, direct, having, you know, a direction. Um, so if you just say, let's change the world, that is, there are so many ways to change the world. Uh, really, like, find that one couple of words, catchy phrase that makes people feel like, I want to be part of this movement. I want to be part of this. I want to give my time. Um, for instance, uh, in the book club, I said it's foster sisterhood and critical thought. And people felt super attracted to it. Like we had people come through Facebook, through Instagram, like random people just founding us through keywords because they were looking for that exactly. And they were like, can we join? And that was amazing. Um, and the goals of an organization, they are longer usually. Like you have, they're more KPI-ish. I mean, usually goals you try to define in a smart way. Um, 
now I have a blog. I don't remember how smart goes on my head, but you probably all know how smart goes, like measurable and uh, attainable and tangible and so on and time frame. So goals are usually more defined in that range. Like, um, so if you say our purpose is, I don't know, for instance, you can make an organization saying, uh, save the bees, for instance, uh, which is clear, like we need to save the bees. And uh, but then the goals will define how we do that. So everybody plants flowers in their garden. Um, people said maybe bee houses in their balcony or garden, so on. So that's, these are the goals. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Darlene. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> so, okay, value, success definition. Um, so also important and very often overseen, overlooked is the branding of a community. People feel like, oh, if we have a purpose, if we have values, people will just come. But depending on your growth plan, and we'll talk a bit about the growth plan later, really think about um, what is the language that is so important, the language you're using, so important. What are the visuals? And maybe objects to st strengthen the community's identity. So objects can be, I don't know, like uh, if you have very small communities like a stick or a metal or something, people get and have to give a gift in, in certain um, times or so on to other people um, and, and visuals, like having a certain visual language. For instance, in the book club, you would think, oh, it's just a book club, whatever. But for four years now, I always create a, a Facebook event for each um, for each meeting we have, which is every month. And every time I find a picture, like a painting or photography or a movie still of a woman reading. So that's been like the visual identity throughout the whole uh, book club journey. We have a logo, which we share a lot. We share uh, a lot of uh, distinctive pictures and images together because we really enjoy that. So it is small, but very meaningful and really, really powerful. And the language, um, really think about the language you're using with your members and with your community. So if you have a specific community with a specific goal, really think about the words and define the words from the beginning. Um, if you are, you know, de depending on gender friendly, like what is, what is a woman? What is a man? Do you, do you use an asterisk? Do you not? How, what does it mean? Maybe make like a language manifesto if language is important. And we all know language is important. Um, think about the words you use or you specifically do not use and keep them in a manual, keep them in an onboarding uh, sheet for everyone to find and further, further down the line of your communication. What is the tone of your language? Are you more casual? Are you more uh, minimalistic? Are you uh, speaking in several languages? Do you translate everything? What is your tone? Very important. And also who communicates? Does everyone communicate? Or does just one person communicate all the time to everyone? Or that's very important as well because you have to assign certain tasks to people, right? And also, how does the community describe itself? Do we have words to describe ourselves? Do we, how do we present ourselves to other people on the outside world? And a very important um, topic in all of this is storytelling. And it's usually completely overlooked. Storytelling is so crucial if you want your, your community to grow. Because storytelling is, you know, take pictures every time you get together, take screenshots, uh, share tweets, maybe you, you know, like create a visual portfolio that helps you and enables you to, to, to do storytelling for your community and for the outside world. So that people see also what you're doing, not just like hanging out. Maybe you have a community aesthetic. If you are a group of sustainable inter uh, interior designers, then aesthetic might be very important. So really think about that. Um, and how also does a community's brand reflect its value? So do you see when you're communicating visually or verbally or, or I don't know, with sound, do you reflect your community's values? Um, and yeah, so how do we identify, how do we communicate our identity to the world? That's also really important um, because you have to think like, if we're a corporation, if we're a company, we communicate differently with the outside world than we would if we are a community. So sometimes you can be a bit cruder if you're a community and not a company, right? But although we have seen in recent years and late years that, uh, even companies have started adapting cruder language with their communities. So like when I mean crude, it's like a bit 
rude, a bit, uh, a bit, you know, on the t like cheek, uh, cheek and tongue and cheek, tongue and cheek kind of style of language. So not as friendly, as nice, as polite as it used to be. So things are changing slightly. Um, so we come to the second part um, of building a community, and that is the experience, which is how do I become a member? What is my member journey like? And how do I exit if I don't feel like it anymore? So when you're creating a community, one important part of it is member selection and also thinking about is your community open or closed? Uh, what's the difference between a member and a non-member? These are all questions you have to ask yourself. And they're hard questions very often because you want to be what my experience is like usually all communities want to have the cake and eat it at the same time. So really think about um, what is actually benefiting your purpose and um, uh, and how actively do you want to grow within your capacities, of course, because if you suddenly have 2000 members, but you have only one community manager, this is going to be tough. So um, selection process, um, how to get members can happen through different way in different ways so through invitation or nomination so you directly go to people and ask them if they want to join um, people can apply because they found the community it can happen through referral or it can also happen through geographical and time restrictions so keep that in mind as well think about how you want your people to come to you i've been in communities where people have to apply with a cv to be part of the community so it's very clubby like as well so really think about how you want to do it it gives you a lot of power thinking about how you select your members because a lot of power and a lot of oversight of who's entering and who isn't. Um, when you have chosen a member uh, and you want them to feel amazing and welcome and happy and fuzzy, it's integral to have an intentional onboarding. That can be take five minutes for a phone call or a video call or you go meet them. Like in my previous jobs, I would go all around Switzerland and Liechtenstein, meeting the members and having coffee with them and talking with them for one or two hours and then go back. And that was just for them to feel truly welcome, really understanding um, the communication and the community, uh, I mean, the community and the core beliefs, the values, the rules and the guidelines. Um, it's also important when you're onboarding your members to clarify what sort of commitment is expected of them. Super important. Do you just want them to hang out and receive your newsletters or do you want them to actually contribute content? Um, and you have to show them how to profit the most out of the community. Is it through relationships? Is it through events? Is it through learning? Is it through workshops? All these things. Um, also show them how to start in the community. What are the first steps? How can they start orientating themselves and guide them towards people who can help them and, and you know, support them in the first few uh, experiences they have. And identify potential members. Always have your eye open, eyes and heart open for people who might be good for your community. That's really, really important. Um, and a part which is overlooked, and I'm just gonna brush through it very quickly, is how do we exit communities? Like how uh, do you say goodbye to a member? So um, think about it when you're creating a community and your member journey how to start, what does experience look like in the middle and how do they leave in the end? Um, because very often people don't think about it and then suddenly like, oh, what do we do? And that can be if you don't formalize it from the beginning. And let me tell you from experience, a year long discussion because you will have a lot of people who have a lot of opinions. So really try to start to do it from the beginning with logic, with reason, with the community together and choose together. So, um, um, when 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 a member feels like they want to go, you can always like think about how does their leaving actually happen? Do they get an offboarding? Do they get a celebration? Do they get flowers, a letter? Do they get a, a you know a call out during your gatherings or so on? Um, is there maybe even an alumni association for your community? Very often, if you have a very passionate community, but people cannot join anymore because of time restrictions, they're having family, they have health issues or so on, but they still want to be somehow involved, it's really worthwhile thinking about an alumni association for your members. So they are still updated on the, on the events, on, on the happenings, on the development of your organization. And also think about it briefly. How do you handle inactive members? Um, we've all seen them. We've all experienced them. Sometimes you have ghosts. 
And some communities don't mind. They're just like, yeah, whatever. This person can just like ghost around, doesn't matter. But sometimes it's kind of harmful to have too many ghosts. So really think about what do you do with members who are inactive? So do you try to re-engage them? Or, try, or, or, or do you have an active transitioning out process? Um, so important, I mentioned it earlier, but it's super important and really central to a healthy, happy, um, passionate community are shared experiences. So celebrations, traditions, and rituals. And when you are creating an event or a gathering for your community, make sure there's soul feeding events. So people feel connected not only to their community, but to the purpose and also maybe to themselves. That sounds all very fuzzy, I know, but we've all been there and we felt connected to people and to a community and so on. And that's because it's a soul feeding event because it's not just, these are our numbers, these are our successes, do it with passion. Like really, community is all about passion. So really do it passionately, do it with some soft core and soft spot. So people feel connected. And those can be annual festivities. So you can celebrate each year existing or you can do um, monthly calls, which are more meeting, meeting E. So really check in regularly with your uh, members. Um, I've been in an organization where we had each month, not a check-in call, but an inspirational call. And they would invite really cool speakers to be, uh, that was actually on phone by the, by the time, but we would be on the phone and listen to the speaker for like 30 minutes. And they would talk about uh, an interesting topic or um, an experience they had. And it was also always really, really inspiring to continue the work we were doing as uh, volunteers in the community. And also make sure that you have something like weekly check-ins or bi-weekly check-ins or a, a life in-person meeting every six weeks or so, so people feel connected. Because people, especially during these times, Corona and so on, a lot of people started feeling very disconnected because everything is happening online. When you're doing celebrations and traditions and rituals, one thing is the most crucial beside the passion and, and, and making it happy is consistency is everything be consistent about your activities if it's a monthly call it's a monthly call and set the date for the next 12 calls so people know when to expect what and they can arrange their time and life and family and hobbies and everything around those experiences tell them with advance tell them with regularity communicate regular because if you say, oh, in 12 months we have this big fest, don't just communicate it then, communicate it every month because maybe you have new members in that meantime. And also when, you think, when you're thinking about shared experiences, think about if they're top down, so from the board or from the management of the organization. So they're usually more telling the numbers and showing appreciation and gratitude to the community or are they more bottom up? So those can be smaller uh, parties or, or, or tea times or you name it. And when thinking about an event, I know people want to be like, oh, it has to have, I don't know, fireworks and dancers and grills, blah, everything like almost wedding style. Simplicity is key very often. So people don't need a lot to have a good time. So make it simple, make the topic simple, make uh, the, the, the purpose of the gathering simple and people will join, uh, enjoy that just as much. And I'm gonna mention it again because it might actually go under in the meantime, but diversity. Diversity is so important in your events. Make sure that when you're doing, when you're having a diverse community, that this diverse community is in integral to the, to, the, to the shared experience. Um, okay, so, Part of the whole experience in, the, in, a, in a community is obviously the content you're receiving, but I'm just gonna go through it rather fast because obviously these are things you have to discuss with your, with your, with your team and with your community, but um, how can the community tell the stories of their members? So there's different ways and you can use Instagram, you can use a platform, you can use a website or you can have a call and each call like one person introduces themselves it's all up to you but definitely talk about your members talk about their stories make them visible um, and it's very important to ask yourself what kind of content creates deeper bonds among your members so very often we create informational or educational content but what kind of content creates 
deeper relationships within the community. So that's the value of the content. And that can be inspirational. It can be exposure to the peers, for instance, like, so aha, here I am. It can create intimacy by um, going deeper with the certain members. It can be, as I said, it can be learning. It can be collaboration, uh, collaboration potential or cross-pollination, which means Oh, you're a large organization. You have sister organizations in Germany and France and in Norway. So they're also create some sort of community and communications between all these sister organizations. Um, when you're a member or when you're creating a, a membership, uh, yeah, a, a community, sorry, I've said the word so many times. When you're creating a, a community, it's important to also to set membership rules. But I think that's kind of a given, um, but really also kind of think about it, set expectations. What is considered a misbehavior? What is considered rude in our circles? Because what is considered rude in one circle doesn't necessarily mean rude in another. So this is important also like think about this. Um, so you might have also guidelines for person in, in person gatherings, especially in times of uh, a pandemic. Uh, think about what rules do we have when we get together. Um, and again, think about in, in this membership rule set, how do we deal with inactive the members? So when you're doing an onboarding set portfolio, maybe integrate that into it. Like, so people know what happens to them if they leave the organization or if they become inactive for a longer time. Without pressure, don't make people feel bad or shame them at any point. <laughs> Just like be, hey, I haven't heard from you in a while and so on. Like make people feel still comfortable even though they're getting on your nerves. And also really important, and this is about governance, and we will talk about that in a second, who can enforce, create, and change rules. This is important because it is, uh, yeah, down the line, you will have to give different roles to different people. Um, when you're setting membership rules, it's important that it's clear for every new member what expectations you have of them. So in terms of commitment, etiquette, and accountability. So be, hey, in our community, we expect a response time of two hours, which is intense, or 24, 48 hours within that time, please respond. We know you're in or you're out. Um, and when you're doing this onboarding, when you're sharing those rules with the people, um, make sure that everyone agrees to them. So um, together, that makes a community and that makes it, makes it less top down, but a communal experience. Um, we've talked about it before, different roles in a community, which are the newbies, the recruits, the, the uh, member who is a bit, uh, the, the regulars, the super users, the managers, the maybe the communication people and so on. You have different roles at different stages of your community experience. And it's important to think about the expectations you have of each level of uh, role or each level of member you have uh, within the community. So in a new person, probably doesn't have the same uh, responsibilities as someone who's been there for a while and can take more responsibility. So think about that as well when writing out your whole community build up um, guidelines. Um, so structure, this is the last part and I feel like I'm kind of, kind of running out of time. Can that be? <laughs> that was way longer than I thought. <laughs> um, you have another 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Later. Great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I'm done in 10 minutes. So, okay. Um, so structure of an organization that gives you stability and sustainability in the long term. And it's important to think about it. So organize. So this is just in brief. What is organ like, what is the organization of your community, the governance, the financing, what channels and platforms do you use and how do you manage your data? Because Probably unless you're a group of five friends just hanging out every now and then, you will generate data. And that data, very important for you in the long term if you want to you know, access money pots or donors or investors and so on, because data is money. <laughs> so um, when you think about the governance of your community, we think uh, about leadership. So how is the leadership organized? Are you holocratic? Are you top down? Are you... Do you do like um, 
how you say it, uh, uh, round circles of, of leadership, like one month you are the leader, the next month you're the leader. It can it can vary and it, de it depends on how your organization is constructed and also if it aligns with your values and your purpose. And here from personal experience, I have worked and been in organizations where they profited openness and innovation and all these things, but the structures were old, rusty, hierarchical, and absolutely horrific. So really um, think about what you're, if you are doing externally, what you're doing internally as well. So really um, do the walk and the talk at the same time and not just the talk because um, it, it will look hypocritical. It will make you lose members and it will get you bad mouth if you do that for a longer period of time, unless you're incredibly powerful, like most companies, but if you're a small community, really check out that your organization and your leadership structure is aligned with your values and your purpose. Um, also again, who does what? So in, a, in, a, in an organization, you have to assign roles and responsibilities and tasks and set them in a time frame because otherwise you will have people who don't deliver. And I mean, especially like in volunteering communities, when you have lots of volunteers, some people will um, meet certain time frames. Really think about timing and who does what. And um, very often in these volunteering communities, we have leaders who are not paid. So you have these Vereine, for instance, in, in Switzerland, or clubs, uh, people do a lot of work without any monetary compensation. So when you're thinking about your leadership structures, also think about how they are um, uh, uh, appreciated, how they incentivized, incentivized to do the leadership role. This can be, for instance, um, a certificate. It can be gifts if you have the finances for that. It can be, you know, a special mention on the website so their name pops up when they're looked. I mean, we have to people do that for experience as well. So really like ask them how maybe they want to be incentivized, but also make sure that you have a set of incentives set in stone that people will get if they take over leadership roles. Um, also, who takes over the community management, who hires or recruits new, new members and new, new, new uh, community members and who manages them. And um, when you're still really, really small, think about what is absolutely necessary. So this is more lean kind of structures. Really think about what is absolutely necessary for the community to survive. So probably that is maybe someone who communicates with the people. Um, this can be someone who, when you're really, really small, so you have to think about, okay, we need to have someone who does a website, for instance, and assign that, or you have to have someone who um, talks with the members on a regular basis, or has to communicate, or has to organize events, so really think about what is, to the bone, the most basic structure of your organization and community to survive, and assign those roles to responsible people. <laughs> and um, um, <laughs> the last question is, what is the legal entity of the community? For most communities, for most organizations, it's not very important at the beginning. You can do for eine, you can do, um, you can do a, a, a Statuten and, and have them officialized. If you're a Verein, for instance, probably if you are at some stage of your organization, you probably know. But um, most small communities don't have to really think about that. But if you have to really think about, first of all, how do the legal things work and who is responsible for them? That's a thing which is overlooked very often. I've been there. Um, and uh, when you're thinking about the roles of your community, think about the knowledge transfer. This is, I don't know how many people are still listening, but really important. Knowledge transfer is key. It is something that I've encountered in every organization I've ever worked in, probably you as well. And it can be the most passionate, wonderful people, but they're disorganized and they don't do proper knowledge management. So you will probably have to reinvent the wheel every couple of months because maybe you have a high turnover of volunteers or members. Really make sure from the beginning that you have an open, transparent and shared platform where you share all the documents. Um, 
archive everything accordingly, have a certain, a, a very strict, be super strict about this, super strict structure of how to save stuff in your folders, for instance, and make it very visible and easy to find for everyone. This way you ensure really sustainable survival of your community. I can't press this enough. I can't highlight that enough. It is so important. I, I, I would, my head explodes every time I, I see that because it's happened to me in every organization I've ever encountered. And it's something that happens, especially when you're just starting, you're just growing, you're just, uh, you know, creating your community and you're so passionate, but you don't do things orderly. So very important. Um, Right on. I think I'm running out of time, definitely. So um, think about the decision-making bodies in your community. We've talked about it. Who are the leaders? Um, finances. I hope you have thought about it. But think about how your community is financed. Uh, do you have membership fees? Do you have a way to uh, generate revenue? Are you nonprofit? Are you for-profit? How does the community uh, pro uh, um, um, profit maybe from the profit? and um, does your community rely on revenue? So do you have to make money in order for your community to survive? So that you need to make sure that you have external and internal revenue sources. And I think that's, okay, that's the last point actually. So I hope you don't cut me out yet. So channels and platforms. So very important. The, the first thing is when you're building a community, think about your community first. That is the most important thing, and the platform is second. So think about the people in real life first, and then think about how you can connect them online. Because um, you need to understand, um, when, when you're thinking about channels and platforms, you have to also think about how your members behave and what are they need. So maybe sometimes you don't need a Slack. Sometimes you don't need an Instagram. And... Um, always when you're thinking about platforms and channels, think that activity level is more important than a variety of tools. I have seen that people feel very attracted to a lot of fancy tools, but that is usually overwhelming for members. Make it simple, have a couple of tools, but not too many, have everything in one place, and you will succeed more than if you have a lot of very fancy tools. And here, just a collection of things um, of, of, of um, uh, platforms you can access to help grow your community. Depending on the platform, you have different access to people. So um, you all know most of them probably, I hope, but um, depending on the platform, different set of people, different expectations, different target group, keep that in mind, but also use them for your own benefit. And last but not least, <laughs> data management. Um, so when, when you're thinking about data management, you have to think about um, your CRM, your community, your, your um, customer re relationship system or management. So that is also something that I've encountered very difficult every time I have a new uh, community in front of me is a CRM. How do you capture your members' contacts? Do you use an Excel sheet? I mean, like sometimes people just have a notebook and that's it. And that is not how knowledge transfer works. Have everything in a place accessible to everyone. Um, and if you have to start very, very simple, start with an Excel sheet. And if you want to continue growing in the way and, and have sure that the Excel sheet has not just the name and the number, but more variables according to the member. So maybe age, maybe region, maybe background, maybe uh, if it's important, gender, um, it shouldn't be, but maybe it is. So you can track how many women or men or all things in between you have in your community. So really like make sure that you also keep your contacts and your members um, in, 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 in labels. I have to say that unfortunately, so you can track them and, and you know, keep an eye of your community. And um, when doing the storytelling, we told, I said that before, really keep all the storytelling, all the communication, all the pictures, keep it together. Keep it together in one place, sort it out accordingly, sort it out with dedication, because if you slack it, let it slack for a couple of months, suddenly you have this complete chaos in your folders, and then no one wants to do that, and you've all been there. So I say that from the beginning before starting anything, just keep it tidy for all the people after you have left the organization. And uh, how do you capture insights and knowledge in the community? So do you have actual statistics or do you just do, um, and statistics also, if you do events, 
track every event, track them, just track them, just have a sheet somewhere where you track all the things you've done, because at the end of the year, when you want to get to a donor or investor, say, we have done that many uh, events with that many people of that age group, of that ethnic identity, whatever, and you have that together and you don't have to work two weeks to make a report. The two minutes you do after the event are worth it combined to the two weeks of hair pulling effort you have to do if you have to make a report. Just do it then. Just do it then. Very easy, very simple. And I think that's it. These are my sources. I have more, but like this is the most important one for you is the community canvas. Uh, it looks like this. So when you are um, making your community, you probably have seen the uh, business model canvas, right? Uh, business model canvas, this is derived from that idea. It is very extensive. So this one little sheet there will never be enough for your community to have a, per, like a, a proper guideline, but it helps you to have all the questions in mind. And it's so, super useful. And I've used it a ton of times. And it's great and it's proven and it's foolproof and it's easy and there's a guideline and it helps you to really, really think and ask all the important questions. And that is it for me. <laughs> really long, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Doreen. So now uh, I would like to open up for questions. Sure. Dear, dear entrepreneurs out there, please. Uh, unmute yourself, show your faces, and ask your questions. And if you're too shy for the questions, you can just hit me up on Slack. <laughs> no questions? No, 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 let's give them a little bit of time. Okay. I have a question. Yes, hi. <laughs> How do you know that you're building the right community? What, what is right? It's, so I could spend a lot of time building a community around something and it takes a lot of work and then I realize afterwards, oh, this wasn't the right community because people were not responding or we weren't getting engagement or some, something like that. How can I preemptively know if this is the right community, to, right community to build or to address? So when you're saying community, are you asking if the purpose and the goals of your community are attractive enough? Or yeah, how do we measure that? I mean, first of all, you can just like talk with people about it. Um, talk about your purpose and ask for honest feedback. That's what I always did when I started creating something. I would, I had an idea and I would be going to my friends and, and random people and just talk about my idea and they'd be like, yeah, that's a cool idea. And then I'd be like, okay, let's do this. And um, do you have like a specific problem right now? Because I, I find it hard because maybe it's a value problem mm -hmm. or a, a recruitment problem. And, and depending, like if, if, I mean, if you have already people in the community, that means you have a community, right? You have already people who have signed up or are in the Slack space or so, or, or whatever, however you're creating your community. And um, if, if that's the case, you already have one. So maybe the question is then, have you yes. defined the values? Yes, correct. Uh, no, that part is correct. So now I know instinctively that this is the right community to build. We have mm -hmm. uh, people on Facebook, WhatsApp, and, and mm -hmm. email. And looking back, I, I spent one year <laughs> and I realized, oh, maybe I should have uh, been focusing on building the right community. The is right, I find, I find it very interesting because any community is the right community. Um, uh, when people come together and have a shared a shared identity and a shared experience, that usually is already right enough. Maybe if you, maybe then it's a recruitment issue you having, like who is having power or decision making power in your community, and is that the right person to have it? Okay, so I, I get your point. So if people sign up, if there is a community, it is the right community. I would say so, because then it means they're interested and they're passionate. And then maybe it's just a question of either assigning roles 
um, giving them proper tasks um, or responsibilities, you know, make people feel seen, make they make them feel valuable because they are. Their time and their dedication and their work is worth a lot. Um, I mean, if you have like, I don't know, like if you have, for instance, a Facebook forum, that's very open. People just come in and, and it's not a lot of work, but you have moderators and those moderators do require some sort of appreciation from the community. Same on Reddit, for instance. And on Reddit, I mean, probably all know Reddit, but on Reddit, you also have the mods and the mods get sometimes appreciation posts and so on to say thank you for doing this. So depending, I think it's important. Um, I don't wonder what you mean with right community. <laughs> Because if you have people, it means something is interesting enough. Right. Something yeah. is interesting enough. But then if you don't see activity, maybe your question is about activity? Yeah, maybe. Uh, yes, maybe. If people sign up then and then they don't engage, then, then uh, it's time to ask questions. Yeah, if they sign up and don't engage, then it can be two reasons. One is it's just like a person who likes to free write, and that happens a lot. And there's nothing bad on it. They just want to maybe be updated on the topic. Um, mm -hmm. Or it can be because you have not assigned proper roles or an onboarding process or a membership journey. So make clear that people who are part of a community feel like they are and not just like part of a Facebook group. Okay. Does that make sense? So I think you have to think about the membership journey in the sense of how does the membership journey align with the purpose and the goals of, the, of, the, of your community, of your organization? Okay. Did it answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, in, a, in an, uh, another way that I didn't expect. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, I, I, I mean, if you have any more questions, I'm, I'm on Slack, you can find me there, and we can talk about it more so I can understand a bit more your issue. Okay, sure, let's take it there. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Anybody else? If not, uh, on behalf of all of you, and uh, on behalf of the Versus Virus community, I would like to say a big thank you to Darin for sharing with us uh, all those important things around how to build a community and how to make it flour flourish. So thank you very much, Darin. As you said, you, are, you will be found on the Slack channel. Yes. So please reach out and now that you are starting to engage with programmers, you need to know how to work with them. So next Friday, we have Victoria Vasileva, who is a solutions architect at Luvago. She, she will be telling you about the product design sprint and how to work with your programmers. So thank you very much for joining everybody. If you have not had lunch yet, please do so and have a lovely weekend. Thank you, Doreen, one more time. Thank you as well, and have a lovely Friday and afternoon. <laughs> yes. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining.